Good morning, NASAP. Thanks for those of you who are here on time. And we've got a long number of stragglers who I can see are getting in a little bit late this morning. I hope that means that you enjoyed the reception last night at the National Press Club and that uh, maybe some of you enjoyed yourselves a little too much after the reception. So did you learn any capital ideas yesterday? I sure hope so. Um, I hope that yesterday you are feeling energized and enthusiastic about the work that you do after all the full agenda on yesterday's program. And you've identified many new ways in which you can continue to drive improvement in your programs to better serve students. A couple years ago, to better understand how schools and colleges were working together, the American Association of Superintendents and the uh, American Association of State Colleges and Universities did a survey of superintendents and college and university provosts, chancellors, and, pre and presidents, seeking out their, uh, their perspectives on collaboration. Of both groups, virtually all of them say that collaboration is extremely or very important to achieving their aims. In sharp contrast, however, just a minority of 33% of superintendents and 34% of higher education leaders characterize their existing collaboration between the K-12 and higher education sectors in their institution as either extremely or very effective. The majority characterize their existing collaboration as only somewhat effective or not at all effective. You all know that concurrent and dual enrollment represents one of the areas of effective collaboration between these two systems to get them out of their silos, to improve student outcomes, and share resources across the two systems. I'm thrilled today to have two speakers to help share with you examples of that collaboration, starting with a national dialogue between the two leading organizations that we all hope has continuing impacts down at the state and local level to increase meaningful collaboration that's going to improve student transitions and student success. I know that you're going to hear ways that you can individually deepen your collaboration locally from the work that they have done. So I'm pleased to let, let me just take a minute to sort of talk about the format for the morning. So what we're going to do um, is uh, first let me just briefly say, you know, I'm pleased that we're going to have Dr. Walter Bumpfus, um, the President and CEO of the American Association of Community Colleges, to join us today. Um, and then he's going to start off by talking a, a bunch about the initiatives from the Community College Association, as well as some of the work that they have done in collaboration with the Superintendent Associations. Following that, we're then going to have Dr. David Schuler, who's the Superintendent of Township High School District 214 in Illinois. And he is past president of the Superintendents Association. And so you're going to hear from him some of the work that the Superintendents Association have been doing uh, on this collaboration. Um, following each of their introductory speeches, we've invited Paul Fain from Inside Higher Ed, who's going to moderate a dialogue and conversation with them here, not just the dialogues that they get to have between their organizations, but here for you, so you can hear some of the, those, those opportunities for collaboration between the two of them. So, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Bumpfus and Dr. Schuler now, save time by not doing two separate introductions. So um, Dr. Bumpfus is the President and CEO of the American Association of Community Colleges. He served as the Chancellor or President of two colleges, Brookhaven College in Dallas and Baton Rouge Community College. Following that, he served as the President of the Louisiana Community and Technical College System from 2001 to 2007. From 2007 to 2011, he served as professor of the Community College Leadership Program and as chair of the Department of Educational Administration at UT Austin, University of Texas Austin. During his helm since then, as president of the American Association of Community Colleges, he's launched numerous initiatives to revitalize the community college sector and position the sector to respond to and adapt to the changing higher education needs of our country, many of which you're going to hear about this morning. Dr. Schuler is the superintendent of Township High School District 214, the second largest high school district in Illinois. His innovation has been recognized in Illinois and nationally as he's taken on leadership roles, giving him invitations to testify about college and career readiness before the education committees of both the House and the Senate. In 2015 and 16, he was the president of AASA, the Superintendents Association, where he launched the Redefining Ready a national campaign that introduces multiple research-based metrics to demonstrate post-secondary readiness. 
He'll be sharing information about that campaign this morning. So with no further ado, Dr. Brumfus, please join us at the stage. Good morning, and Adam, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I only wish that uh, my mother-in-law were still available to have heard the intro. Very, very nice. Uh, Good morning, all. It's great to be with you today, and I'm delighted to join my colleague and good friend David Schuler uh, for our presentation today. Uh, the work of college readiness and dual credit enrollment uh, is so very, very important to the work that we all do. I've got just a few slides I'm going to go through, but I'm going to give you just a brief commercial about community colleges. We serve 1,108 community colleges across the country, and you can see here on this uh, slide that they're located across the 50 states. Uh, we serve a total, and this is the last audited enrollment, 2015, we had 12.2 million students, uh, head count uh, that includes credit and non-credit, and about 60 plus percent of our students were full part-time rather than the rest were full-time. Uh, full but I wanna talk with you this morning about several of the initiatives that we have ongoing in the American Association of Community Colleges. Uh, we like to say that we serve our member colleges in a number of ways, and one of the most important things we do is setting a vision and doing convenings. Uh, over the last seven years, we've embarked on a listening tour, our 21st Century Commission that I convened in 2012 for the purposes of looking at what could we do to improve the performance uh, and outcomes of our community colleges. At that particular point in time, we were receiving a great deal of criticism because of the low graduation and retention rates. And while we haven't achieved the goals that we set forth all together, I'm thrilled, really delighted with the trends I'm seeing regarding student completion and graduation rates. They're all on an upward trend and we're doing very well. In uh, 2012, I launched what we call an implementation strategy where I pulled together 109 community college leaders for the purposes of addressing the nine goals and strategies that we put together in the report. And then we have a 21st Century Center. That's an online center for colleges, universities, high schools, and the like to go to to look at some of the best and most promising practices in education. We've launched a 20, uh, Structured Pathways program fall of 2015 through an $8.5 million grant from the Gates Foundation that's now turned into a $20 million grant doing structured pathways across the country. We've just uh, concluded uh, working with 30 colleges in a three-year project, and we're now launching projects in the state of Texas, in California, and in Arizona. We've got a project called the Right Signals Project where we're working with 20 colleges on workforce training, highlighted by work we're doing with apprenticeship training, and then we have our voluntary framework of accountability. We do a lot of work in advocacy, we like to say that we're your seat at the table here in Washington, D.C., and I have to tell you, that seat at the table has become more interesting as of late. And I'll leave it at that. We can talk more about that in the question and answer period if you'd like to have more information on that. But the item we're here about today is our focus on college readiness. This is such important work uh, that in the past year, I have assigned a lady by the name of Dr. Tammy Reichert. I don't know if she's in the audience or not this morning. Tammy, if you're here, I see you now. She's right here in the middle of the room. But she's been charged with pulling together and doing the work uh, of our association in conjunction with AASA. AASA is led by Dr. Dan Dominich, a longtime friend of mine. And when I came to Washington, the two of us have been talking about working together for a long time. And so we launched uh, these college readiness summits, initially sponsored by Hobson's and most recently by uh, uh, our corporate partner of AACC, ACT. And Dr. Angel Royal, my chief of staff, worked with me in the early stages of these summits to convene these groups, and so I'm delighted and pleased at where we are in this pro with this project. We have now annually convened at least twice a year work groups of 10 to 12 college presidents, 10 to 12 superintendents, looking at ways in which we could work closer together. Adam, I was struck by your comment about the notion that only a third of the projects said they could do better because the thing I'm hearing from most high schools and most colleges, 
is that they really enjoy the work that they are doing together. I've had the chance of meeting David Schuler at our first convening, and we've learned so much from some of the great superintendents like David. One of the challenges we've had across the country, and for those of you that have been involved in this work, you know uh, one of the challenges has been the turnover, the turnover of superintendents and the turnover of college presidents. When I was the president in Dallas, uh, and, and Adam referenced that this morning, in the seven years I served as president, I think I worked with almost seven superintendents, either full-time or interim, and that's not the exception necessarily. There are a lot of cases like that, that in some situations you have the college president that turns over. But nevertheless, there's a lot of great work going on around the country, and I'm thrilled to be able to talk with you a little bit about that. We are going to be doing some developmental ed redesign work. And then lastly here, one of the things that we are very ambitious about is providing technical assistance to community colleges across the country to do work like structured pathways, to do work like college readiness, and how do we get into that. Let me uh, share with you just a little bit of specific information about what we've been doing with our AASA partner. Since 2014, we've hosted six convenings designed to share and learn opportunities for how CEOs and superintendents can work better together. If you go to our website, we actually have the proceedings from those documents ava excuse me, available for you. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of uh, examples of what I would call innovation and what's going on in this K-12 community college readiness area. Uh, pilot programs at Arkansas State University, uh, Newport, and Cedar Ridge High School. Do we have anyone from Newport in the audience today? I don't know if anybody's here or not, but I understand. There, I see a hand waving in the back of the room. Good morning, sir. And, uh, but we're delighted to have them with us, but they had four areas of certification proficiency that they were working on, computer networking and technology, welding, service maintenance, diesel technology, nursing and phlebotomy, and employers have committed to encourage the certification of students to pursue two and four years degree, two and four year degrees while they're working together. One of the things I've heard from all of our superintendents who have attended, and uh, I've heard it from all of our college presidents as well, are uh, the powerful meetings that go on between faculty from the high schools and faculty from the colleges pulling together to help develop curriculum and, and work and facilitate the outstanding programs that go on for our students. The Dallas County Community College District provides a program of free transportation passes for 123,000 students, scholarships to all 40,000 participating students who are in the early college programs, early college high schools, and providing support to participating high schools. So just already you've seen a district like the Arkansas State University Newport, which is a smaller district, as big as districts in Dallas, and those are some huge districts, and Dallas would be one of probably the top 10 community college districts in the country in terms of enrollment, and certainly the city of Dallas would offer that. Another outstanding uh, collaboration we had uh, that was presented to our participants was the one from Elgin Community College in the Central School District 301 in Illinois. Uh, they formed the faculty-led alliance for college readiness to support projects developed by both institutions, and this partnership prepared students for career and college life after high school. Through the work of the alliance, over seven years, 65% of students moved up at least one readiness level. And those are the kind of outcomes that we were seeking. Seminole State Community College in Florida and Seminole County Schools. And as I said before, each one of these projects required that the superintendent come as well as the college president. Not that we didn't trust one or the other. We just wanted to make sure that they were confirming <laughs> and, and validating what was being shared. But the dual enrollment programs there allow students to earn credit towards high school completion of career certificate are an associate of bachelor's, our bachelor's degree at one of the Florida public institutions. The high school district has made Seminole State College of Florida the college of choice for its graduates. And while we don't have a total figure or percentage of high school uh, graduates that have transferred on to those community colleges they work with, I would imagine that it's very, very high, especially as it relates to their first opportunity to go into college. And so we're pleased that we can become that college of choice for a lot of the high schools. Prince George's Community College and uh, Prince George's County Public Schools were actually a presenter at our most recent summit. And Dr. Charlene Dukes, uh, the president of the college, and, and her superintendent provided us with an outstanding partnership that they're doing there. 
It, they formed a partnership called Dual to Degree, a dual enrollment program that charges 50% tuition at the community college. And, and then to participate in the program, high school students must score at least college level in math and English on placement, placement tests. If a student goes directly to the community college after high school graduation, he, she will continue to pay half price tuition. And the Prince George's Public Schools covers fees and textbooks for free and reduced price lunches. I had a chance to see this partnership up close and personal. I was the uh, commencement speaker last year for Prince George's Community College. And their uh, speaker that evening was a young lady who had participated in the program previously and had uh, received scholarships to go to John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins, I'm sorry, and, and then with another scholarship to go on to the University of Maryland to pursue her doctorate degree. So we're really having some outstanding students coming through these programs, and I couldn't be more pleased at the results. Another one we had at the last uh, convening was from Kirkwood Community College in Iowa and Iowa City Community College District. Uh, Kirkwood Regional Center is effectively leveraging local and state investments, and the partnership is designed to help both students and parents understand the value of different career pathways. Again, that pathway notion that I spoke about earlier. A presentation we had, I believe, in the previous summit was one from Wallace State Community College in Alabama and Cullman County Schools in Alabama. But they have a fast track program there which involves no classrooms and allows students to complete 30 hours of general education college credit at their own pace online. That was a different approach, but one that was equally effective uh, based on the uh, feedback we got from the president and the superintendent. This program also integrates several fast track to industry pathways, and this is something that a lot of uh, colleges are seeking to do because of the requests that we're getting from the business community. In fact, I had a call on Friday uh, of last week uh, from Congresswoman Virginia Fox uh, asking me about what programs would I identify as being uh, maybe most effective. And this is certainly one that I'm going to be convening a call with her on uh, this coming Thursday. But we've got some really good things going on in Alabama. And with that, I'm going to sit down and then allow my colleague David to come up. And then I believe we're going to uh, then answer a few questions that uh, Paul Fain will be directed towards us. So, David, won't you come on up, sir? Thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much, Walter, for the kind words. It's uh, always a pleasure to share the stage uh, with you. Uh, I'm very honored to be here with you all today. Uh, and uh, you know, a couple years ago, when I was president of AASA, we had the opportunity really to engage a conversation about what it truly means to be college ready, career ready, and life ready. And, uh, and so we launched this initiative, and over the course of the last several years, we've had just incredible, incredible feedback and uh, insight and momentum building this movement really towards ensuring that ESSA implementation workbooks incorporate uh, a wide variety of readiness indicators that are reflective of what the research actually says. Oops. So we launched uh, Redefining Ready, and you can see our hashtag on our website. All of our, uh, all the research is available there. We have COSIN, NASSP, PDK, the National Superintendent's Roundtable that have endorsed the work. Um, and you know, one of the things that I'm just so happy and honored and joyous about is, I know uh, ACT is one of the uh, sponsors of this program, and they've really recognized this work and this philosophy that our students are more than the score they earn, right? It's, it's beyond just preparing kids to take a test, right? And it's incredibly important for all of us to recognize and acknowledge the fact, you know, that we all learn in a variety of ways. Everyone in this room learns in a variety of ways. Our kids learn in a variety of ways. They must be able to demonstrate readiness in a variety of ways, right? And I think for so long, under No Child Left Behind, we got in this mentality that all we had to do is focus on teaching our kids how to take a test well, depending on what our test was in our local school systems, right, in our states. And why would we ever want to create a generation of graduates who can do one thing well if we want to be the greatest global economy the world has ever seen? The ability to take a test well, right? 
we need a wide variety of skill sets of our graduates, right? And so that's what we did. And so we went into this meta-analysis and looked at the research from the leading educational institutions and research organizations. Again, all of that information is available on the website. And what we found related specifically to dual enrollment, concurrent enrollment uh, programs was pretty powerful stuff, right? So you look at this uh, research out of the National Center for <clears throat> Post-Secondary Research and uh, the research out of Florida that talked about dual enrollment students were statistically significantly more likely to persist to a, in college to a second semester, right? So what did this do? This made me go back and talk to our team about does this research relate to what's happening in District 214 in my district? And you know what we found out? It did, right? And so this created a, just a significant mindset shift for us away from thinking about dual enrollment and concurrent enrollment as competition and instead as recruitment, right? If our students are more likely to continue after graduation, if they have dual enrollment when they graduate high school, that's a good thing, right? And so we had to kind of reimagine our opportunities for dual credit opportunities for our kids. You know, when you consider that 82% of high schools offer dual enrollment programs, we have to consider that as part of our college readiness indicators, right? If kids are earning college credit, of course they're college ready. That should be embraced and affirmed and supported. With your state accountability workbooks, with the work you're doing, make sure that dual enrollment, concurrent enrollment counts. It has to count for readiness. You know, and so uh, this is, again is available on the website, but when, when we talk about being college and career ready, and this is really hard to see, so don't even think about look, trying to figure it out. I've got it broken down in the next two slides, but the, um, right? Uh, so it's really important for all of us to understand, and we've totally drank the Kool-Aid at AASA, our kids must graduate college and career ready. It is not college or career ready. Right? I'm not suggesting for a minute that every child has to earn a certificate or a degree. But if somebody is going to access a living wage job over the course of their lifetime, they must be able to access some post-secondary education. And I was sharing this presentation a couple months ago in Southern Illinois, and I had someone raise their hand and say, well, what about a family farmer? I didn't have to say a word. Right? Three people jumped up and said, if you want to make it in the family farming business today, you have to access some extension courses and learn about seeds and crop rotations and dirt and water, irrigation, agribusiness. Right? And you think about any, any sector that's out there, police, fire, science, right? the military. How do you move in advance? You access coursework and you demonstrate proficiency. Right? So we believe at AASA that all students must graduate with the ability to access post-secondary education. So if you look at the academic side, that the college readiness indicators, and there's tons of research to support the importance of GPA and GPA being highly predictive of post-secondary success. And uh, you know, Columbia University has done tons of research on this work. Uh, and Davidson Community College, who was at one of our uh, convenings, has done, and I don't know if anybody from Davidson's here or not, but Mary has done an incredible job at Davidson Community College looking at just GPA for college placement and college readiness 100 level uh, courses. 2.8 on a 4.0 GPA, and then one of the following indicators, and it might be an advanced placement exam or just taking that class. And all of these indicators have to be instructive, not create excuses for us, right? So we know that there are a lot of places in this country that have barriers to accessing advanced placement, right? You need to have this GPA. You need to be able to have this sort of a test score. We blew that up, and we said anyone who wants to take an AP course can take an AP course, right? Because part of our work, part of your work, part of our collective work, part of AACC's work is not only about motivating and inspiring, but being aspirational in our intentions, right? And that's what it is. We have to plant seeds to change the trajectory of our children and their families' dreams. So if a kid wants to have an AP experience, let them have an AP experience, 
right? That's their choice. That the only thing that can result from that is something really super positive. A dual credit college, English and our math. Why do we focus on English and our math and, and these indicators? Because we know those are the biggest barriers to freshman success, right? And so what do we, what do we wanna do? We wanna make sure if a kid is ready to access a 100 level English and our math class their senior year, let them have it. Let them take that class, right? And then you follow that up with being able to pass that developmental and or remedial uh, college class. You all know the stats of how many kids persist if they have to take a developmental or remedial class, right? So how has this been instructive of our work? Instead of having our students their senior year take their placement exam, we have them take it the spring of their junior year. Right? If they test into a 100 level course, they access that class their senior year. If they don't, we'll run them through that developmental or remedial course their senior year. And if they get a C or better, they place into the college credit bearing course. Right? It also ensures that our kids are taking a senior year math course. Right? And you all know the importance of senior year math. Right? And so we have to ensure that we're providing those opportunities. Algebra 2, I ha I'm not an algebra guy. I, up front, I'm a social studies guy, right? I didn't even like Algebra 2, right? But I had no idea until I did this research and em embarked on the study, the importance of Algebra 2, right? Algebra 2 proficiency is the capital T, capital H, capital E, gateway course to post-secondary success. So two questions. Number one, does every child who walks through your high school doors as a freshman have the ability to access Algebra 2 proficiency by the time they graduate? And in many places, the answer to that is no. And that's a problem, right? That has to be addressed, right? And then if we know and understand the fact that, that taking that class after Algebra 2 is even more important, almost a drop the mic moment for post-secondary success, how are we ensuring that all kids have that opportunity to take that math class after Algebra 2? And then IB exam, uh, EPIC out of the University of Oregon has done the majority of research in, related to international baccalaureate programs and, the, and their research is pretty overwhelming. We still wanna make sure that we in, allow students to demonstrate proficiency through the use of a standardized assessment score, uh, an SAT or an ACT, as well as most of your college and universities have, your, have placement exams uh, if they don't have a grade point average as the threshold, and they should be able to do that as well. And then you see at the bottom we have those additional factors, right, that contribute to college success. Grades, earning A's, B's, and C's, FAFSA completion. And again, now that kids can complete their FAFSA so much earlier, how is that instructive of our work? How are we having, we, we run FAFSA completion nights, right, with food and childcare for our kids and our families, right? The enrollment in a career pathway course sequence, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Academic advising, bridge programs, senior year math class, and as I mentioned, that class after Algebra II. So that's on the college readiness side. On the career readiness side, we require all of our students to identify a career area of interest, right? Why is that? Not because I'm suggesting a 14-year-old is gonna know what they wanna do with the rest of their life, right? But what we do wanna do is we wanna plant the seeds that our kids are dreaming differently. Because I would argue our kids can only dream what they see. And at least in my district, I've got students in the northern half of our district who may have two or three generations living in a, the same apartment. And on the southern half of my district, I may have several generations of students living in the same trailer. And they only know what they know, right? So I have, uh, I'm blessed to have two children, both adopted. Our son we brought home from the hospital. And about six months after our son was with our family, we got a call from the adoption agency saying, we have a two and a half year old little girl being abandoned by her mother. Would you consider raising her? Well, they asked that question pretty right, right? Like abandoned by her mother. What are you gonna say? No, 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 pass her on to somebody else, right? <laughs> so obviously we said, of course, we'd love to bring her into our forever family. So our daughter uh, was born to a mother who was incarcerated. And for the first two and a half years of her life, she was passed around from family member to family member, right? And um, the only thing that they all had in common is they all did hair, right? Now, if you choose to do hair by choice, that is awesome. Our daughter knew nothing different, right? And so for the first six weeks she was with us, she sat on her bed and just brushed her doll's hair. She knew she wasn't gonna get in trouble. She knew there was not gonna be any trauma, right? 
Our daughter is now seven and wants to be a scientist, right? But for the last five years, we've been planting different seeds in her mind. And in so many places in this great nation, that doesn't happen at home. So we have to do it. We have to do it together. That's that aspirational intentions of our work, right? So I want our kids to be dreaming differently. And I'll tell you what, at least in the greater Chicagoland area, when you take a look and you turn on TV, you're not seeing the dreams that I want my kids to see all the time. So let's be intentional about that. So identifying that career area of interest, and then two or more of the following, right? Attendance. We all know that our employers always say the first thing they want their employees to do is show up, right? They prefer they'd show up on time, right? But they need them to show up, right? <laughs> and so usually at this point, somebody who's a former dean or a dean of students will usually raise their hand and say, I don't think 90% is high enough. And my response to that is, I really don't care what you think, right? <laughs> I, I don't. Like, the people that did this research is called Attendance Works. That's all they study is attendance. So I'm going to take their word for it over what you think. And the reality is pretty profound. <clears throat> if you have a 90% or better attendance rate, you double the likelihood that you're going to finish school and college post-secondary. That's powerful. That's powerful, right? 25 hours of community service, a huge aha for me. Did you know that community service to fulfill class requirements increases the likelihood of college graduation by 22 percentage points? 22. So what that's done for us is we've completely reimagined our freshman human geography curriculum to incorporate community service into that core curriculum. And then when you consider the fact that the majority of students who don't go to high school or don't go to college after high school stay in the communities in which they went to high school, it's kind of important that they learn how, what it means to be a good community citizen. A workplace learning experience. We offer 3,000 external workplace learning experiences a year for our students, right? And we kept learning in there because this is not about just sitting and job shadowing. This is about actually learning about a workplace experience to decide whether it's something you want to do or something you don't want to do, right? Which is equally, if not more important, right? We fail forward all the time in my district. So we uh, had a, a female STEM student doing an internship at Buffalo Grove High School as we were doing some work on a pool. And I was so excited. You know when you know what you're, you know the answer you're going to get and it's going to be really affirming to you, right? So I went up to her at the end of the internship and I said, so what, how was it? What'd you think? And she said, I have never been so sure of anything in my entire life that I want nothing to do with electrical engineering. <laughs> and I said, that's awesome. We just saved your family tens of thousands of dollars. It's always half full in Dave's world, right? So, uh, but making sure we provide those workplace learning experiences. Industry credentials. I completely acknowledge the fact that the level of rigor in, in, in different credentials is different, right? Again, it doesn't matter from my perspective, right? I get the fact that a C-plus certification is much more challenging than perhaps a sanitation certification. But here's the reality. You can't get a job in hospitality industry without that sanitation certification. So if that certification is in the pathway that child wants to pursue, that student wants to pursue, that should be supported and affirmed. Dual credit career pathway courses. Obviously, we all know the importance of that. And I'll show you just some numbers of our dual credit as we've embraced this work of providing access to early college credit, concurrent enrollment, dual enrollment. And then two or more organized co-curricular activities. Right? We know that relationship between a conductor and a musician or a coach and an athlete more often resembles that of employer-employee than, than that of a teacher and a student. And that should be affirmed and supported. So if you think about this work, and this just came out of the American Council on Education recently, that talks about students who participated in dual enrollment programs were two and a half times more likely to transfer to a four-year institution than students who did not. Again, powerful, powerful data regarding the importance of offering college credit to our high school students. We have an initiative that we've branded in our district called the Power of 15. Every child, not just our high flyers, every child must have significant cognitive delays. Every student has access to 15 early college credits before they graduate at a low cost or debt free option. Right. We've completely drank the Kool Aid of Adam and NASEP's work, right? The importance of offering those opportunities. Why 15? Because you all know the research. If kids get to 15, they're going to make it. 
So why would we collectively, between higher ed and K-12, not want to make sure the majority of kids get as close to 15 as possible while they're in high school? Again, recruitment, not competition. And so, you know, when you look at this data, and we have a wonderful partner in, our, in Harper Community College, which is our community college partner, but if you just look at this slide, 51% of our students who go to Harper who don't have early college credit, 26% of them graduate uh, from a four-year college or university, and that's about half the student body. 49% of freshmen enroll at Harper with 15 college credits, or bringing those 15 with them to their freshman year in college, and of those, 50% graduate you double the likelihood of graduating if you have those 15 college credits. We have to get in and engage in this work in a way that not is just the traditional, are there only career pathway courses. We must expand to the core. We've done that in 214, and we've seen amazing results. Our dual enrollment uh, has skyrocketed 362%. Enrollment at Harper of our dual credit enrollment has also skyrocketed, because again, we've shifted that mentality. Last year, our students earned 34,500 early college credits. We have 12,000 students, right? So this is a, an important initiative for us, and it must become an important initiative of all K-12 and higher ed institutions across the country. And so as you think about this work, as you uh, uh, engage in this work, you know, it really is about ensuring all of our kids have access to whatever they dream about and what their dreams uh, where their dreams take them, right? And so I'm happy now to sit down and share the, the conversation with Paul and, and Dr. Bumpfus. Um, and if there's any questions you have, go to the website, see me afterwards. This is something I'm so incredibly passionate about. And together we can break down those barriers that may exist. I'm pleased to add to the, the dialogue here, Paul Fain, who's the news editor. He's been with Inside Higher Ed uh, since 2011, after he spent six years covering leadership and finance for the Chronicle of Higher Education. He's also worked in higher education and public relations for Windermeyer Communications, but really it seems that his passion is for being a journalist and a reporter. Uh, prior to that, he had been a staff writer at Seville Weekly, a newspaper in Charlottesville, and has written for the New York Times, the Washington City Paper, and Mother Jones. He's won numerous uh, journalism awards, including one from the Education Writers Association, as well as the Dick Schaap Excellence in Sports Journalism Award. So thanks so much, Paul, for joining us today. Thank you. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Great. So as you heard, uh, I, I've been writing about higher education for a little more than a dozen years. And I have to say, never before seen the sort of urgency around collaboration between K-12 and higher education. Um, can think of a few reasons for, for really what's driving that, but I wanted to start there, and maybe with you, Walter, sure. if, if you feel that way as well. What, what do you think is really driving it right now? I, I, in my opinion, I, I do believe this focus that we've had on student success and completion, Paul. Uh, David's numbers were just so impressive, David. Great presentation this morning. I really enjoyed looking at the, the data that you provided. But Paul, the extent to which our colleges can have a willing partner uh, like a superintendent uh, who's willing to bring us students who, if you want to term it, college ready. I'm not totally sure what that means, but I love the way you yeah. defined it, uh, that it makes it a whole lot easier for our colleges to then take those students and have them, first of all, graduate from our college and then certainly move on to a four-year degree. Uh, but the extent to which we can provide them with an associate's degree or a certificate, Paul, uh, it certainly helps them get into the world of work easier, but also not only get them that first job, but then the next job and then the next job, because that's what we're trying to prepare them for. Absolutely. Would you like to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I think I agree completely with, uh, with Walter. I mean, our focus can't be on graduation as the end point, right? I mean, mm -hmm. graduation means nothing, right? I mean, how successful our kids are after graduation is what really matters. And so we talk a lot about the role we play in the cradle to careers pipeline with an S. Because as Walter said, mm -hmm. I mean, the world is going to reinvent itself several times over our kids' work life. We have to ensure that they have the skills to be that adaptable, flexible, um, insightful employee. Right, absolutely. So I think you both did a really good job in your presentations about talking about the value of a college credential mm -hmm. and, and what that means. Um, our discourse isn't 
always as thoughtful these <laughs> days. And uh, I feel like, you know, at the same time that more and more data shows how important some amount of post-secondary education is to entering the workforce, the middle class, you, you see a lot of the discussion of we need more welders, not more philosophers in, in, in you know, state and federal policy circles. And of course, we realize that inside higher ed that welders go to college too. Absolutely. Um, but you know, as you as you look at the you know, to be totally fair, I don't want to be glib. This is a, I think, a, a crisis for higher education. We we had a, one of the most popular stories we've done in terms of clicks this year showed a, I think a 21 percentage point decline among Republican voters in the view that higher education is good for the United States. So you re and it's not just the, the right. Um, we're actually seeing a lot of skepticism um, from polling from Democratic folks on kind of the value of college and how that reflects free mm -hmm. college proposals. So how do you how do you thread that needle? How, how do you, you know, make sure that folks realize what you're talking about isn't necessarily always a liberal arts education or, or what, what have you? You know, I think sometimes uh, there's a false dichotomy here. I think folks want to frame it as either or, and it can be both and. Uh, I think we have an obligation in higher education to provide our students with a well-rounded education but also a pathway to hopefully employment. I uh, had a board member in when I was in Louisiana used to say to us, Dr. Bumpus, I don't really care, and she used some um, <laughs> choice language, I'll put it that way. But her point was, I don't care if they get a A, B, B, A, B, S, I want them to have a J-O-B at the end of the day. <laughs> and, and, and so uh, when uh, I heard and read about the wonderful statistics you guys provided, about this, and we had a big discussion uh, on this last week within what we call the Secretariat. Mm -hmm. and, and we talked about the fact that, and I would add though to that data, that I think they all like their community colleges. Views about higher education was one sure. thing, but they sure. all love their local community yep. college. Because I think they see us as being relevant. I think they see us as being affordable. But I think one of the major criticisms is what they refer to as the elite or the liberalism and so forth. And I think we all have a responsibility is that we gotta make our communities better. The extent to which we can help those employers find uh, qualified job applicants, help them find jobs, I think we're gonna be better served in education. Uh, I've had a chance just the last few days to be back in my hometown of Austin, Texas and, and sitting with the president of the community college there who had just had uh, Tim Cook there from Apple, they're doing some wonderful work with robotics. Now, do you think the community likes them or not? The answer is yeah. You know, so the extent to which we can do more of that kind of work and publicize it, I think we're gonna be better served. Absolutely. Dave. Yeah, I think we have to own our story, right? I yeah. mean, for so long we've been trying to justify and rationalize other people's narratives of public education and partnerships. And I think we just have to own it, right? I mean, you're doing great things, we're yeah. doing great things. It's all about creating that next workforce and that, and that workforce development, economic development in your communities. And as long as that's the lens through which you share your story, I think you're gonna be successful. And then I think the other thing is we have to reframe what it means to be community partners, right? So mm -hmm. historically, especially in K-12, we ask, community gives, and we say thank you, right? Uh, that, that's not gonna work in today's world, right? I mean, we have an opportunity to really shift and think about the return on investment for our community partners. So in our website development classes, in our app development classes, our students go out and adopt a small business in the community that doesn't have a website, and they don't have an app. And they work with that employer to provide their capstone project is an app or a website for that business, right? So think about what happens in that. Our kids have to have the oral communication skills to be able to go out and basically function as an employee of that employer. That employer gets something she or he would have never been able to get, couldn't afford, right? And I get a lifelong supporter of public education, right? I mean, that's that rethinking of how we partner, which I think when you partner and they see that return on investment, they're going to then think more highly of the institutions in their community. Paul, if I could just yeah, add sure. one other Absolutely. comment here in this discussion. In many ways, I do not believe that the outcomes have caught up with the activities we've had going on. I agree. And let me say a little bit more about that. We have had a lot of investment from K-12 and from higher education in terms of improving student success. But the narrative that the public has read has been probably three or four years ago data 
Uh, a guy by the name of Uri Treesman, whom I'm sure both you gentlemen know about, Uri is considered to be the foremost authority in the country on developmental math, and, and they've painted a real good picture of developmental courses. But Uri calls developmental math, and with no disrespect to anybody that teaches it, a burial ground for the hopes, dreams, and aspirations of our students. Yep. In essence, now more colleges and more high schools are focusing on that, and the outcomes are better. But in fact, the public doesn't always know about it. They know about low graduation rates and the like. And so the extent to which we can continue to publicize the great work that's going on, uh, I think the public's going to have maybe a better opinion of education and the relevance of it. Sure, sure, yeah. makes sense. So um, there's a lot of interest in apprenticeships yeah. in Washington and, and all around the country, um, and, and really the, the German model of, yeah. of uh, you know, seeing a career earlier in your in your academics um, and that obviously gets to the pathways works mm -hmm. and what you both spoke about in this country though I think th there's also resistance to what people view as tracking uh, you know students are kind of being funneled into pathways and so you know th it seems to me that there's wide agreement that we need to do more of, of making careers kind of uh, visual to students early on but how do you how do you thread that needle the the, the kind of challenge of of funneling people too early, or what do you say to folks who worry about that? Is it? I don't think you can funnel kids too early from a mindset perspective, right? I mean, I, if I would talk about this all the time, like kids, and there's research out there to support this. Kids make the decision to take school seriously in fourth grade, hmm. right? That is the year, hmm. right? So I want our fourth graders to be thinking about what they might want to do post high school. Sure. I don't care if that's what they do or not. I want them dreaming beyond high school, Understood. right? And you know, I. I had the, the great fortune to spend two weeks in Europe just studying their model, mm -hmm. right? And I'll tell you, I love ours better, <laughs> right? I mean, kids in second and third grades are getting set on that track. And yeah, they officially make the decision in fourth or eighth grade, depending on the country, but it's really the second and third grade teachers that are making mm -hmm. the decision. And can you imagine no. second or third graders in our, in our country making the decision on what they want to do and if they're going to go to gymnasium or the apprenticeship? It, it makes no sense to me. So I love the work that we're doing. You know, kids identify their career area of interest their freshman year, and then we'll give them a workplace learning experience throughout their high school experience to see if that is something they want to explore. And if they do, we'll greatly accelerate their, their pathway, right? Sure. And if they're still not sure, we're going to spend time working with them to find that pathway. And so I, I love our model, and anybody who, you know, apologize for any international attendees, sorry, Adam. But uh, I mean, I, I just think asking kids in elementary school or teachers in elementary school to put a kid on a track just is so unfair to them and their families. I like dreaming, not tracking. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, I, I, from a standpoint of tracking, uh, on a personal level for me, that uh, has a lot of impact because in high school, while I was an honor roll student, my guidance counselor, boy, no disrespect to guidance counselors, <laughs> but uh, basically told me, Walter, you probably shouldn't think about college. And I remember oh. saying, well, wh why not? And she said, well, from your background, I think maybe you need to think about uh, working on cars or something. And I said, well, okay, but thank God I had a coach and a counselor, another uh, counselor that told me, uh, Walter, we can get you a scholarship to Murray State, you know? And I said, oh, okay, I, I do, that sounds pretty good. The point I'm making here is that tracking never has been good. But on the apprenticeship side, I had dinner two weeks ago at the Swiss Embassy and we were talking with them about their apprenticeship model. Mm -hmm. And like David just said, they really admire what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing examples of that around the country where students are getting an opportunity at early ages to start to look at opportunities and have experiences, most importantly, where they're looking at, this could be me in this job. There are people that work there that look like me, yep. that uh, maybe have backgrounds similar to mine. Right. And the extent to which we can help people be successful, whether it's going all the way for a PhD or finding employment in a field that maybe they hadn't thought about, mm -hmm. I think are going to be good. I, in fact, have sent, I've got four kids. Uh, anyway, I won't get into that. Some of them have done very well. Some of them have, uh, our youngest son, Brian, I think about his 10th year pursuing that bachelor's degree, but he's going to make it one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> but, and he's getting a well-rounded education, I would add. <laughs> but it, it, his mother thinks it's probably about time for him to accumulate these credits. We're cobbling together these credits and then finding a job. He's already got his electrician's license, so he's doing very, very well. Sure. But my point is simply this. You've got to find opportunities for people that have the interest in, capacity for uh, some of these jobs, and they can do very well. Sure. 
So given all the policy maker interest in, in the work mm -hmm. you all are doing together, mm -hmm. what, what, are, what would you like to see from the states and from the feds, or, or what are some examples of, of helpful legislation that... that <laughs> Well, we're right in the midst right now of the Higher Education Reauthorization Act. And my hope is that, and I have to believe at this particular point in time, we're, in, we're going in the right direction. I think we have superintendents that are enlightened. We've got college presidents that are enlightened. And I think the extent to which we can do more of these kinds of discussions, and I'm seeing great interest on the part of the Senate and the House right now in terms of what's going on out there, what's working. And I don't know that in the past we really had evidence of what's working. And I think I'm seeing much more research-based projects happening mm -hmm. that we can really point to and say, now, if we could have investments from the federal government in some of this, it'll help. But in many cases, it's not going to be their investments. It's going to be our interest and our ingenuity to be innovative and do the kind of things we need to do at the local level. Sure, absolutely. I agree. I think um, the attitude and approach that the Congress is taking with uh, HEA reauthorization is very different than what they've taken in past um, lifting past legislation. Where I think past legislation, NCLB is a perfect example. It was focused on <clears throat> trying to fix the lowest performing schools rather than celebrate what works. And I think, as you know, Walter just mentioned, HEA, at least the conversations initially, mm -hmm. seem to be about supporting what works. Mm -hmm. And I think whenever you try and pass legislation to fix what's not working, it ends up just bringing the entire profession down. And then we have to recalibrate and lift. Whereas if we can focus on what works, hopefully we'll rise everybody, raise everybody up. Sure. Yeah. So, so uh, time for one more question, I think. Um, you know, we're here talking about collaboration. So, so what would you like to see from, from your community to kind of take this to the next level uh, or the other side? <laughs> what, are, what are some key pieces you think could really take it to scale beyond where you are? Yeah, I think it takes courageous leadership. Right? And I think, you know, something that uh, Walter mentioned earlier, sustainability and leadership matters. I mean, we, you, we need to have boards at both the K-12 level and the higher ed level that support the longevity of leaders to do the work. Because when you have a transition of superintendents or presidents, it's really hard to keep that momentum going. Absolutely. I just say ditto to what my <laughs> friend said. I, you know, I've talked often about the fact that we're well past the time when we can do the friend and family plan of hiring. Yep. And, and that means you're not going with the best leaders, whether it's K-12. We've got to continue to focus on those leaders uh, who have a vision, those leaders who want to make a difference in our communities. And I think those leaders will be rewarded, and uh, hopefully they'll continue to move some of these initiatives forward. I, for one, am very excited about the partnership and the collaboration we're doing, Paul. And, and I think uh, our board and I have decided that it's so important we're going to not only uh, continue to do it, we may even double down on it. We're doing two a year now. We started with one a year, then we're doing two. I can envision a time maybe when we're doing three and four of these a year uh, so that we can get some of this uh, out there where we can stand it up and, and maybe get Ashley or someone from your organization. You guys have been great too, by the way, of uh, at least in my opinion, putting some of the best practices out there, but we need to do more of that. Great. Well, yeah, we, we follow the action, and, and this is where it is right now. You guys so. do it. Do well, it well. I, I think uh, I, I hope you all join me in giving uh, the panelists a, a hand of applause. Thank you.